Long ago, in a living room very much like yours, two women made up a podcast on how movies link up to each other, and they called it Six Degrees of Feature Film. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Six Degrees of Feature Film podcasts. I am your host, along with Stacy Howard. Hello, Stacy. Hi. And I am Miss Movies, because I just say I am your host, but, you know. You are Miss Movies. But you are the host, too. It's I two am, hosts. It's two hosts. We're co-hosts. I guess. Yes. We'll okay. just call each other well, hosts. Ho- host. <laughs> you are the host. I am the host. We are all the hosts. That's right. Hearts. Join us. Okay, so today, this is our first episode, so we're very excited about it. Um, also, <laughs> also a little nervous. Um, but anyways, six degrees of feature film. Here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to take one feature film, and we're going to show you how six different movies link up to that particular film. It's kind of like Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, if you have ever played that game, and we'll definitely be playing that game at the end yes. to show how he links up with our feature film. So today our feature film is Back to the Future from 1985. Right before we started recording, I, I got a little news from Stacy, and uh, a little bit I'm a little bit shocked. So why don't you go ahead and share <laughs> Well, your okay, news. so I <clears throat> had actually never seen back to the future so when i i know it's an audible gasp from the audience it is um but i don't know why i hadn't seen it it's just one of those movies that i always knew i would eventually come across it i would eventually see it i had seen clips of it of course i'd heard about it a thousand times from friends and family and everyone who loves it it's an incredible film but i finally just sat down by myself alone to watch it in its entirety for the first time last night for the purpose of this podcast and I loved it I thought it was incredible so yeah it's a shocking piece of news that I was a, a back to the future virgin and had uh, never experienced the uh, gloriousness of it yeah so, well and- this is the year to actually see it man you won't really know what that means until the next film which she hasn't seen any of the films no so I'm hoping you'll go and watch all three I will. And what you'll notice is the first one is the best one, mm-hmm. but um, but the others, they do a pretty good job. They do now, a pretty good job. Have you heard that they want to do, um, Christopher Lloyd was talking about, he wants to do a fourth one where they go to ancient Rome. I had heard something a little bit about that, and I think he's absolutely insane. <laughs> really? But, <laughs> <laughs> see, I would want to see it. I don't want to see anything else with Back <laughs> to the Future. Let's leave it at this. Okay, maybe I should wait until I see yeah. two and three and then yeah. see, see if we should keep going. But. I know Robert Zemeckis has, like, alluded to something like, not not ever going to happen. This is, yeah. that's it. We're that's done. It. Yeah. <laughs> so. The trilogy has been completed. Exactly. So if there's anyone else out there that's like Stacey and has not seen this film, which, you're crazy. I hope you're, like, ten years old or something. Um, but... <laughs> It's about a young man who accidentally is sent 30 years into the past in a time-traveling DeLorean invented by his friend, Dr. Emmett Brown. And he must make sure his high school age parents unite in order to save his own existence. Obviously, there's a ton of issues with this because of the fact that like, as soon as he meets them and as soon as he interacts with them, there's no way he particular he would never be born. Like that just wouldn't happen. Yeah. But at the same time, Oh, and I want to make sure that everyone knows that we are going to be talking spoilers in this. Oh, yes. Because we're going to be talking about these films in full, so. Bruce Willis was a ghost. (laughs) Wait, (laughs) what? (laughs) (laughs) All right, so. I I think that's kind of the hilariousness to it, but at the same time, it's like, well, you have to do that suspension of disbelief, like... Right, you have to kind of just embrace the fact that this could never happen. It's a little ridiculous, but that's the fun part of it, is what would happen if this, you know, were going on, and if you go and go back in the past and meet your parents. And that's actually where the idea from the film came from, I think, is uh, right. Robert Zemeckis, the director, was wondering, he saw like a high school yearbook photo of his dad, and he was wondering, like, would I be have been friends with my dad if I met him back then? So that's where the idea of the movie came from. Right. Or something like right. that. So I was like, it's already a ridiculous premise, so you just have to go with it. Exactly. And not question the rules of the universe too much, because then you'll just be like, no, 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 no. Everything would unwind the second he goes back in time and all that stuff, so. Right. This is starring Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly, who's the main character. Christopher Lloyd as Emmett Brown. Dr. Emmett Brown, I should say. Leah Thompson as Lorraine Baines, which is uh, Marty's mother. 
uh, Crispin Glover as George McFly, which is Marty's father. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thomas F. Wilson as Biff, who's the asshole in this whole thing. And uh, Claudia Wells as Jennifer Parker. And Claudia Wells, although Jennifer Parker is kind of a more of a minor character to all this, but uh, my main thing is where did this relationship between Marty and Dr. Emmett Brown begin? Yeah, because he starts off the movie and he comes into, you know, his, um, clock his work room. studio, clock room, garage, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. Right? And it's, at, I guess he has like a, maybe a summer job with, him, not summer job, like a before school job where he like takes care of things for him, maybe like earns a yeah, money. Yeah, we can pretend that. Thing. That sounds Let's good. Pretend, that's what I assumed when I first okay. saw it. It seemed like it was one of those little school jobs you would have, like a family friend needed help in their office or whatever. Mm-hmm. So they okay. did a favor and, you know, hired your kid to do a few things like around the office like you know uh, errands upkeep stuff like that so personal seems, assistant yeah, sort of item. it seems like marty does that for doc but how did he meet him how, where did this like whole relationship start because they obviously know each other pretty well and he's been working working i don't even know what he does for him for a while and he's you know it um works for him enough to where he's like yeah i'll wake up and be at the mall at one fifteen in the morning for you right like, that's you know well when someone says you know i've made a time machine like Come see it. But then, he doesn't tell But does he say that? Machine. Okay, good. Because no, you've seen it most recently. Yeah, he's just like, be at the mall at one fifteen, And he's like, oh, okay. Like, he doesn't even question <laughs> it. If it was right. me, I'd be like, I'm not waking up at one fifteen for you. If it's, it's like, just, you know. What if Emmett Brown is like a pedophile? Yeah. Like, this is all a big scheme. What if- um, other information about this film, it was directed by Robert Zemeckis, and it was released July 3rd, 1985, um, which is now 30 years ago. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. It had its. Support. I'm like, wait, I can do this math. I can. It. The budget was 19 million, and it grossed 389 million. It was the highest was grossing movie of 1985. That's awesome. I know. It was incredibly popular. Everybody loved this. And they thought it that people wouldn't love it because. Oh yeah. There were just some controversies. Like, no, people aren't going to be okay with this, and Disney wouldn't take it because of the whole like, it's kind of incestual because he's with his mom in the past, but she likes him, and... That's right. Yeah, because they... They weren't okay with that. Yeah, they thought that was too risque, so they passed on it. Which is, I mean, it's... It is kind of risque when you think, because the whole time, I was kind of cringing, because I'm like, oh, is this mom, oh my god! But it's... That's why it's funny, is because it's so cringeworthy, but at the same time, it's like, I can kind of understand... Because she might be attracted to him because she, like, sees something in him that's familiar. It's familiar because it's her son, obviously. Right. Um, which is what we know, but what she doesn't know. So, I don't know. I, I had some interesting thoughts thinking about that and what, you know, the whole, I guess, what is it? The Oedipus Complex or whatever. Right. <laughs> and everything. Exactly. So, yeah. No, it was too risque for Disney. So, they passed on it. And no one thought it was going to be a hit. And, um... I remember reading about, like, the, there was all different kinds of casting choices going on and different, um, wasn't it Eric Stoltz was cast, and they right. actually shot several weeks of the movie, but then it wasn't working out with him, so then they brought on um, Michael, Michael J. J. Fox, Fox yeah. uh, who was still shooting Family Ties, family ties and right. so they were like, okay, you can do the movie, but you can't miss a single day of Family Ties. You have to do this. Like, yeah. shoot it at crazy night. Crazy hours. Oh, yeah. Crazy hours. You know, they, like, wouldn't even let him do the movie because they're like, this is ridiculous. Right. What, this movie's going to be done. And it was, like, the biggest thing ever, so. Well, originally, they wanted him first. And then, because of family ties, oh, they no. couldn't, like, the, there was too many conflicts. So then they went with Eric Stoltz. And then when that wasn't working out, they went back to him and were like, can you, come mm-hmm. on. Let's let's work this out. Let's figure this over. out. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting. I do like that aspect of we're going to shoot, like, when something's not working, Mm -hmm. them just scrapping it and restarting rather than just continuing to go along with someone that's not working or Mm -hmm. something that's not working. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. I Mm -hmm. wish there was more of that. But that could mean I'm out of a job. I Mm -hmm. don't know. (laughs) Anyways, um, so I don't remember my first viewing of this movie. I'm sure when I was, uh, you know... Obviously, I was only four years old when this came out, so I don't know when I saw it. But my most current viewing was probably... I mean, I see it all the time on television. If I see it on television, I'll usually continue to watch it, depending Mm -hmm. on, you know, who's around. Like, if my kids are... My kids, I would let them probably watch it, but because Mm -hmm. they wouldn't know what's going on. But Mm -hmm. 
Um, normally they would take then control of the television and we'd be watching something else. Mm-hmm. So probably about two years ago is when I watched it in full again. My favorite scene is the Johnny Be Good scene. When That's he, my like, favorite scene too. Gets on the guitar. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I do like, I always say like, I love how, um, is it Marvin Berry? Oh gosh, I forgot. I think it's Marvin Berry. Yeah, I love how he's like, it's Marvin Bear, and he calls his cousin Chuck. Chuck. And it yeah. was like, okay. hey, you know that lo- that new sound you've been looking for? <laughs> well, listen to this. So. Exactly. And then it's like, wait, he plagiarized the, this song. Yeah, then. exactly. So it's like, wait, so he didn't even come up with that song. How he dare he? It. I know. And my least favorite scene is at the, like, right at the dance when, like, when George McFly is, like, trying to take down Biff for, you know, mm-hmm. and he's, like, thinking about walking away for a mm-hmm. second and then yeah. decides not to. I just don't like that. I just don't like the whole scene. And there was a website. It's a disturbing. Exactly. Okay, so there's this website, and I know you know of it. It's called I See the Frog. Mm-hmm. And in one of their articles, they talk about, like, paradoxes in film and things like that. And, like, kind of like, well, this could be controversial or something. And so in one of their articles, it says, In Back to the Future, in the original timeline where there is no Marty, there is also no Marty to help George man up. That means that George, in the original timeline, actually walks away from the scene, knowing that Lorraine is about to be raped, which she is. That actually wouldn't you happen. You mean the original timeline? Yeah. Like, as if, if none if of this Marty stuff ever happened? If Marty didn't show yeah. up, but they wouldn't. But it's not what, true. Yeah, that's because <laughs> she would have been with George in the car. Right, then. exactly. So that, yeah, that wouldn't have happened. Because they would have gone through all the other yeah. steps, like, oh, he is spying mm-hmm. on her in her room and then mm-hmm. falls and then gets hit by her dad's car. Like, all that. Which, that so, was super funny. That he yes. was a toy. <laughs> he's like, he's a peeping Tom. I thought oh, that yes, was hilarious. That was great. That yeah. was great. My least favorite scene is actually right in kind of one of the opening scenes when you first see Marty interacting with his family and um, Crispin Glover and Leah Thompson have the old makeup on. Mm-hmm. And they're, I'm just like, this scene is a little ridiculous. Right. Like, it looked like their old makeup is really... I mean, it's good for the time, but it really dates it because it looks just very fake. And it does. They're all, everything's all kind of over, over-exaggerated to mm-hmm. show that, like, you know, they don't have, they're not the most successful family. They don't have a perfect life and everything. And so they're just trying to show that, like, everyone's got their own problems and, like, she drinks and he's, like, a little aloof and, like, all this stuff. But right. I was like, this is a little over-exaggerated. I get the point mm-hmm. that, you know, it's not going to end up this way after he comes back and everything. So Right. I just love how, though, when he does come back, how everything, aside from, like, like he's the same, his sister and his brother are the same, and their house, where they live is the same, yeah. but their it house would, is different. Yeah, it's it would just, be just totally hilarious. different. And why isn't he different? Right. Like, I mean, well, yeah, change? that's the whole paradox now, yeah. right? Yeah. And why doesn't he remember? Uh, uh. Like, if he comes back through, shouldn't he remember now his new memories from this new right. life? Maybe it's like the butterfly effect. Did you ever see that film? I did with Ashton Kutcher. Yep. And mm-hmm. it's like anytime he changes something, then like all, like when he goes back to his current time, all the memories like come to him real fast. Yeah. I think they did that really well in that film, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's not a film we're linking to, but. No, that's, that's <laughs> not the best film in the world. No, um, but, but I, I do bet, remember yeah. watching it. Yeah. Anyways. Interesting. Yeah. Let's mm-hmm. let's do a little bit of trivia here. Yeah. Okay. Johnny Depp auditioned for the role of Marty <laughs> McFly. Awesome. Which they totally forgot about that. The director um, was like recently, I think in the DVD commentary uh, for the Blu-ray or something like that, was looking through and he was like, I was looking through my notes and I realized we saw Johnny Depp for this movie. I couldn't believe it. I yeah. totally forgot. So I guess he didn't impress them with his audition because they were like, yeah. Oh my god, Johnny Depp, what? So that was I thought that was pretty interesting. And Ralph Macchio turned down the role of Marty McFly. Oh, that would have been interesting too. Yeah. He's an idiot for turning down the role. He thought it was about a kid, a car, and plutonium pills. Yeah. So I don't really know what he read, but yeah. hey, you know who knows what kind of like treatment or they give you when Yeah. When you're out for an audition. I have no idea. It's probably just yeah, some kind of like general synopsis front page and they're like all right go in for it and read this scene yeah so they probably don't give you the whole script who knows i don't know um okay so ronald reagan loves the scene mentioning him and he even referenced the where we're going we don't need roads line from the movie um in a state of the union address that he did so he thought that's, that was hilarious that's what makes him awesome right yeah. Right? <laughs> um, no, but they had to clear it with the White House first, and they thought he was going to be like, what? That's just terrible. No, he thought it was hilarious. Huh. So I thought That's that was great. kind of funny. 
So the last bit of trivia that I'm going to share, and then we'll go on to our, our first offshoot of links, um, is that according to Bob Gale, on October 26th, 1985, a group of people showed up at the mall that they used as Twin Pines Mall location to see if Marty would arrive in the DeLorean. That and is he didn't. Hilarious. Now, if that were, if this situation were today's time, and let's say in October 26th of this year, like people were going to be lining up to do that, I bet there would be like a whole event. Oh like, yeah, for it. there should be. It would be like a marketing thing. Isn't? Oh, absolutely. Haven't they already done a few marketing things? Like they released the they have. limited edition sneakers and like all this stuff. Mm-hmm. They have a whole thing planned in October yeah. that I'm hoping to go to. The Enchantment Under the Sea dance though is already sold oh, out, so I cannot go to no. that. Oh, Anyways, that would have been. Awesome so the to go one to. link. So now we're finished with our first film, which is our feature film. Back to mm-hmm. the Future is our feature film, and now we're going to break off into other films that are connected to Back to the Future in some way or form. So the link that I chose would be time travel movies. And so Stacy and I are both going to present uh, a time travel movie that we enjoy. And from there, it's kind of like a re- we're doing a reverse bracket. So we're starting with one and then eventually like branching out Uh so you'll kind of understand how that works as we go along but Uh Stacey what did you pick for yours so I for my time travel movie I picked about time so about time um I am not a romantic comedy kind of person it is not it's my least favorite genre actually so I didn't think that I was gonna like this movie I thought it looked really cheesy I absolutely love this movie I think it's so cute and adorable and a really really good um part of a a really good example of what the genre should be which is not just a focus on the relationship part of it but like how do people live and their relationships with other people and that's what I liked about the movie so if you've never seen About Time and I hadn't until this past week so there you go you hadn't seen Back to the Future and I hadn't seen About Time so I watched About Time because I thought I need to know what this is about yes gotta do my homework Okay, so the synopsis for the movie is, at the age of 21, Tim discovers he can travel in time and change what happens and has happened in his own life. His decision to make his world a better place by getting a girlfriend turns out not to be as easy as you might think. So uh, the cast, it's um, Domhnall Gleeson, uh, who's of course going to be in the upcoming um, Star Wars Episode Seven. Uh, Bill Nye plays his dad. Uh, Lydia Wilson plays his sister Kit Kat. Lindsay Duncan is his mom. Rachel McAdams plays his love interest in the movie. And then Margot Robbie, before yes. Miss Famous Wolf of Wall Street, now Suicide Squad, everything. This is, I think, one of her first big, like, kind of feature films. So she has a small role in the movie. And it's super adorable. So basically, his dad comes to him on his 21st birthday and says, I have a family secret. All the men in our family can time travel. All you have to do is go into a dark place in, you know, a corner or a house or find a cupboard or something, mm-hmm. squeeze your hands really tight and you think about what moment in time you want to go back to and you can go back to that time. So now he can fix mistakes. Yes. He can, you know, um, meet a woman, have a really bad, awkward conversation, but he likes her and so then he'll run upstairs, pop into the cupboard and go back and actually <laughs> kiss her when he's supposed to and not have an awkward fall or something like that. But that doesn't right. always work out for the better because right. sometimes... You know, when you meet a person, it can't always be perfect, and you can't always be, you know, on your game and 100% all the time. So the movie right. is really about his relationships with everyone in his life, whether it's a girlfriend or a wife, uh, his sister, his dad, which they have a really beautiful relationship in the film, friends, coworkers, stuff like that. It's just really, really a cute premise, and they mm-hmm. have some genuine observations about what your priorities should be in life and how not everything is perfect, but... You just need to appreciate the time that you have because not everybody can travel back in time. So I thought that was really cute and I loved it. Everybody, all the performances are adorable. I completely fell in love with Donald Gleason and um, he's just super adorable in the film. I keep using that word, but he is exactly what I would want to have as like a boyfriend or a husband is he's just like, you know, sweet and loving and just very, very much down to earth. Not the perfect guy, but perfect for whoever he is with. So I thought that was super cute. (laughs) My husband calls this movie the time traveling notebook. Oh, it is. So it is the time travel. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it has the actors from the notebook. Exactly. And also, they just have really great chemistry, and they they're do. just super adorable they to do. watch. And you kind of forget about 
like because the relationship is so good and the dialogue is so good you don't question the rules of the universe and you don't look at well this is a little cliche or ridiculous like you just enjoy watching these relationships on screen because they're so like genuine and heartfelt and like exactly. you can picture their life together so um this is by richard curtis who also did love actually yes yes, yes. so i was like oh yes i do enjoy love actually yes so, so he knows love and he knows what is funny and awkward about relationships right? and how to toe that line because sometimes some of the stuff that happens in this movie could be creepy it could be considered super super Absolutely. creepy <laughs> there are certain times when he makes it awkward and yeah. then he like has to go back and fix it exactly he's like, that was really awkward he's like let me just disappear for a second can you just hold that thought and go and to a corner and then you see him go back again and try and fix it and yes. yeah so it could be considered really creepy because he basically stalks this girl um and right. makes her fall in love with him or they fall in love genuinely right. the first time they really like each other mm -hmm. and then he has to go back in time to fix something for his friend for his job and then having done that he realizes oh no that means i never would have met her and gotten her number when we right. originally met so now he has to meet her in another way and so he tries to like find ways to meet up with her and then he'll approach her and he'll forget like oh I forget she doesn't know me and so he'll start talking to her as if they have already had this conversation and it's really weird he comes off as a total creep so um, but it <laughs> he could, does he does but, yeah, but it could funny. be creepy but it's mm -hmm. not or it's it's not eventually because it works um the writer works it out mm -hmm. to where their dialogue and their chemistry does become genuine and you really do root for them so Okay, There's so a, one part of it that I thought was kind of interesting is like they show um, time passing with um, the couple, mm -hmm. um, and it just is like the inside of a subway hallway sort of thing and there's a band playing and like you see them coming in and going out and it's like all you can tell that time is passing of their relationship and mm -hmm. I really liked the way that they yeah did that. it's like showing the different seasons and how the relationship mm -hmm. is progressing and they're you know falling more and more in love and becoming close and very comfortable with each other and it's just on this single it's like in a single um location but then the couple keeps changing and going on through the season and everything so i liked that a lot i thought that was really cute um so it came out in 2013 the box office gross in the u.s was like 15 million so it did moderately well and then um i first saw it in theaters with my girlfriends we had like a, a girls night and um we just loved it and then my recent watching was it's on hbo go i think so i rewatched no. it again probably like a month or so ago and it's um it's just super cute and i always it's one of those movies where i can put it on in the background and um you know just have it on and you don't necessarily have to see every part of it because every scene has something you know cute or heartfelt or sad or or whatever and so you don't you know you don't necessarily have to pay attention to it it can just be a movie that's on all the time um so i really liked that and then my favorite scene um, and this is going into spoilers for the movie, so if you haven't seen it, pause, watch it, come back. Hey, you're back! You watched the movie! I bet you <laughs> yes. loved it! Hey! Okay, so when he goes back in time, so his father unfortunately passes away from cancer, so he decides, um, right before one of his children is born, because you can't go back in time before a child is born, right. because, to a time before a child was born, because then it would change, like, how the you gender, conceive that child, right. gender, all that stuff, so... Um, when a child is about to be born, he goes back in time to the last time he saw his father and ha or one of the last times he saw him, um, to have a conversation with him and tell him goodbye. And I thought that scene was super heartbreaking and sweet. Right. And they decide, you know, to, and his dad kind of knows because his dad knows about time travel and all that. So he's right. like, Oh my God, this is the moment, isn't it? Oh, is, <laughs> is your child about to be born? Like he knows exactly what's right. going on and completely accepts it. And it's like, okay, let's just have a nice day on the beach together. And I was, like, losing it in the theater. Yes, I that was actually my least favorite. Well, my least oh. favorite scene is the fact that she wants to have a third baby, and so I was like, no, I know what that means. <laughs> I can't see I his dad anymore. And so it reminded me a lot of the movie To Jillian on her 37th birthday. Have you ever seen that? Mm -mm. Okay, so in the movie, a little bit of spoilers for that movie if you are interested in seeing it, although... It's not really one that people like talk about or think about anymore, so I don't necessarily know what <laughs> audience is going to be looking for that film. Um, so the wife exists as like um, a figment of the father's imagination, and he feels that he always sees her and can be with her if he is on the beach. Mm -hmm. So if he leaves the beach, um, 
like to go into the house. She doesn't come into the house. She's only on the beach with him. And so mm-hmm. he's he's decided to live in um, this beach community, like live at that house. That was his summer home. And he decided mm-hmm. to live there full time because he wanted to continue to see her. Mm-hmm. And then there comes like a moment where it, like it's finally time to let go and to leave the beach house. And it's like, is he like, how is he going to let go of that? And how is this, you know, knowing that mm-hmm. I'm not going to come back and I'm not going to see her again. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, no, it's too oh. Jillian. Uh, that's a good, it's a, that is a good movie as well. But I, like I, I said, think, I don't now, know how many like people like a lifetime movie or was this no, really uh, Peter theaters? Gallagher was in it. Michelle Pfeiffer was Whoa. in it. Um, Claire Danes was his daughter. And he, he leaves that area because of his daughter. Cause he's like, I need to, I need to finally go through a grieving process of mm-hmm. letting my wife go, mm-hmm. you know, and and actually, like, be with my daughter now. Because mm-hmm. I think she's off to, I want to say she's off to college, like, at the beginning mm-hmm. of the film. And anyways, it's interesting. It's a stage play. Oh, okay. That they made oh. into a feature film. I'm going to have to watch that movie. Sounds fascinating. I think Freddie Prince Jr. is in that film. I, it's been a while, <laughs> so I don't know. Okay. I mean, I might love it if it's Freddie Prince Jr. That's going to be amazing. Uh, my least favorite scene was when he sees an old girlfriend of his, and at the time it sounds like, um, or it, it seems like they, he might like cheat on Rachel McAdams and have an affair with his old girlfriend, which is Margot Robbie. And I was right. like, no, 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 don't do that. And I, for a yeah. moment, I was like, oh, this scene sucks. But then, you right, know, it does. Yeah, eventually, you know, he makes it makes him realize, like, wow, I have a really great woman in my life. Like, it made right. him realize how special she was and seeing an old love of his where he was like, I didn't even, that was such a superficial thing. I need to go to the real thing. And, you know, so just the moment when you think, like, this might happen. I hated that moment. But it eventually mm-hmm. works out. But, right. yeah. So that's that's about time. It's right. It's super adorable. One of my favorite romantic comedy, dramedy, whatever you want to call it, movies ever. And I think it's a really, really well-made, um, underappreciated movie. And uh, here's some trivia for it. So, this is the third movie that Rachel McAdams stars as a love interest to a time traveler. So, she was in the time, this one, The Time Traveler's Wife. Ugh, have and you I'll, seen that? I have not seen it. <laughs> it's I, rough. I thought it was, it looked creepy because then he it meets is. her as a little girl it's... and she's like in love with him and I'm like, oh. And then also she played um, in uh, Midnight in Paris, which I love that mm-hmm. movie. And it's, you know, also a time traveler's wife, girlfriend, fiance, whatever you want to call it. So she likes this genre. She likes the genre of time traveler wife movies, which is a very small <laughs> subgenre of, t- of time travel movies, which is a subgenre of romantic comedies. So, right. you know, good just, for that. My recommendation is let's all skip the time traveler's wife. Cause yeah. it's just not, it's, it's not. It's not good. Okay. <laughs> so, Skipping. Skipping. I over. also liked that Zoe Deschanel was originally cast as Mary. She would have been interesting, but dropped out due to scheduling conflicts. Mm. And then also, okay, so this movie it also has three of the Harry Potter series co-stars in it. So That's it's got fun. Richard Griffiths, uh, Bill Nye, and Donald Gleason, who have all been in nice. Harry Potter. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, it took me a while to finally, when I was watching, I was like, that's that guy from Ex Machina. Like, yeah. hey. hey. Hey, what? Hey. I know him. Yeah. He's awesome in everything. He's super adorable. I'm so excited to see him in episode seven because he plays a baddie, apparently. Oh. So, yeah, he's a bad guy. We'll see how that works out because he's always a good guy. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so the movie I selected as my time travel movie to link back to Back to the Future um, is Somewhere in Time, which came out in 1980. Um, and it stars Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour. They are the main two um, people in this film. It is about a Chicago playwright that uses self-hypnosis to find the actress whose vintage portrait hangs in the Grand Hotel. And the thing about this film, it's a romance film. The thing about it is that there's so much paradox that it's absolutely insane. Like, the whole thing. Because in the very beginning, and I haven't seen it for a while, um, but, you know, I, I did research on this. But in the very beginning, he's finishing up his, this play or something in Chicago, and, um, and this woman, it might be in Chicago, uh, and this woman comes up to him and says, come back to me and hand something to him. And he's like, what? <laughs> 
what do you mean come back to you? You know, like, what is what does this all mean? She gives him, like, a watch or something. Come back to me. And so then he, like, investigates all that. And then he's trying to figure out, like, where how can I come back to her? What is this talk? What is she talking about? And he figures out like who she is and just everything. Like she gave him that watch at the beginning and said, come back to me. Well, he takes that watch with him to the past and leaves it there. So there's no, I was like that, that wouldn't work. If you take it to the past and leave it there, like where did it come from to begin with? Mm -hmm. Like, nowhere <laughs> it doesn't it makes no sense <laughs> so that is one of the huge issues with the movie is that it, the entire the entire thing is a paradox it was made on a budget of five million and it grossed 10 million at the box office and was released october 3rd 1980 it was nominated for one oscar which was for best costume design mm. so good times i actually when was when I was getting married, like I wanted my dress to look similar to the style of Ooh. Elise McKenna, which is Jane Seymour's character. Mm-hmm. I was like, I want something that looks like Elise McKenna and like Kate Winslet in Titanic. Like, are those even similar times <laughs> or styles? But it is. It's nineteen twelve. It right. So they're both that mm-hmm. would that would work. It would it's cross over to both. Mm-hmm. And and when during my wedding, one of my friends came up to me and she was like you remind me so much of Elise McKenna. And I was like, that's what I was going for. <laughs> Hooray. Congratulations. Go <Goal> Met. <laughs> um, so, yes, this is a nice love story. And I I think when I first saw it, I might have been like six years old, like mm. at a friend's house. You know, I don't really understand what's going on mm. in the film, but I was like, oh, this is really pretty. And mm-hmm. she's a beautiful actress. Beautiful, and they're in love. Characters. Yep. And there's this picture of her in the Grand Hotel, which is the reason he goes back. And it's just like a beautiful picture. I've always wanted to go to the Grand Hotel, which is in um, Mackinac Island oh. off Michigan. And um, I don't know if I'll ever get there, but that would be a lovely goal <laughs> to be there. Um, the last time I watched it might have been within the last 10 years. I mean, it's really slow. Like, when I saw it, I was like, oh, man, this is taking so Like, I know where it's going. Let's get there. Mm-hmm. Let's get to this point. Mm-hmm. That's, I remember, that's pretty much what I got here. Let's see. So I vaguely remember my mom watching this movie on, like, TMC or something or TCM uh Turner Classic Movie something like that mm-hmm. and I was like oh my gosh Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman is in this yes. oh my god Superman is in this it's Christopher yes. Reeve and Jane Seymour gorgeous actors and it's one of his isn't it his last movie he did before his accident Ugh, I think it could be the, I it might, might have to his, look that up it might be his last movie before his accident and um I remember my mom being like oh my gosh I remember this was one such a big deal back in the day because they were just these two beautiful A-listers being in love in this movie. And it's so, it's so like pandering to the woman audience, you know, back in, you know, back in those times where it was like just these incredibly romantic, it's all about the longing looks and the, Mm -hmm. you know, longing glances and all that stuff. So I was like, oh, this is going to be ridiculous. But I remember thinking like, they're so gorgeous and they're such good actors. And I like vaguely remembered the plot. I must have been like eight or nine years old. So I wasn't really paying attention but it's like he goes yeah. back in time to meet her. They fall in love, but then he act. Isn't it like he accidentally gets sent back to his time, and then he's like yes. trying desperately to get back to her because he loves her so much. Yes. Something like that. It's really sad. And it's like super sad, and they don't get back together, right? He doesn't find her no. again. No. Okay. Here's what happens. So pause. <laughs> watch the movie. Come back. Thank you for coming back. Hey. Um. Welcome. So what happens is he's. They're like talking, and he um, he's he's talking about his outfit because she's saying it's outdated. This is an outdated outfit. Like you need to be wearing something like more like the other men around here, because mm-hmm. you know he just went to a costume shop to get his outfit so he could travel back, and he didn't know mm-hmm. that that wasn't of the time. So he's like, "But I have all these cool pockets, and look at this! I can keep a penny in here." And then mm-hmm. he brings it out, and the penny says 1975, and mm-hmm. so then everything just kind of like disappears and Mm -hmm. so 
then he's back into 1975 or whatever time it was. And, or, you know, Wait, it might why, not, it might not have been. Why did Penny do that again? Because I, now I'm remembering that yeah. moment. So why did so that So when he, in the beginning, is gonna, about ready to travel, you see him take his change out of, you know, he brings, he's about to bring money and he's like, no, this is, I have to change out my money for the, um, for the old time money. So I don't. Oh, because it's a hypnosis yeah, it's thing. A hypnosis. If he is reminded that there is another time and that he has another life, it'll it'll yes. bring him back to that. So Correct. he can't have any reminders of right. his his real life. He needs to be focused, and that's why that happens. Yes. Oh yeah. Now I remember, and I remember yes. having anxiety because I was like, "Oh no, no the thing, the mistake, yes. the mistake you're not supposed to make in the movie." And yeah. And then like he, so he comes back to time real time and he dies of sadness yeah like it's just <laughs> sad so sad and then at the very end they're like in heaven together and they yeah. they reunite and mm. how nice is that <laughs> but it's just like <laughs> oh god no oh why gosh. why um no he actually his accident was in 1995 according to this oh, so he would have done okay, other things um but it's one of the last i mean yes Super sad. It really is. I remember being like very disturbed by this because I was like, he literally, he just can't go back to her now. Like they can never mm-hmm. be together. I was like mm-hmm. really, really beat up about it. I was like, no, my little seven or eight year old self was very disturbed by this movie. My mom was like, calm down. It's just a movie. I was like, no. So my favorite scenes, um, when he sees her picture for the first time in the hotel, like that's kind of very beautiful in the way that they shot it and it's kind of like a little misty and yeah I don't know it's kind of interesting um and then my least favorite scene is the end part obviously I mean it gets a little dark there um some trivia about this film um let's see the actresses who auditioned for the role of Elise McKenna were asked if they had ever been in love before and Jane Seymour was the only one that said no oh so that's interesting this is William H Macy's first film He's, he plays like a theater critic or something like that. Mm-hmm. And originally, the director wanted John Barry to compose um, the movie, but he didn't have enough money. He was like, there's no way I can get him. I'm not even going to bother asking him. And so Jane Seymour was like, hey, why don't you have John Barry compose? And he's like, I can't get him. He's too expensive. And she's like, well, why don't I call him? And yeah. then he did it. So Dr. there you go. Woman getting things done <laughs> as usual. All right. So that concludes our first link of films to Back to the Future. So we started with Back to the Future. We went to time travel movies. We talked about About Time and Somewhere in Time. And now we are going to break off from those movies. So Stacy's going to break off from About Time. She's going to tell me what, she's going to reveal to me what category she selected as her, as her link. And then she's going to tell me two movies that come under that category. So we're going to start with her, and then I will do mine. Okay, so from About Time, I my link is Bill Nye movies. Oh, fun. Because Bill Nye is I a like fantastic him. actor. He was one of my favorite parts of About Time. He plays the father, obviously. So I picked two movies he is uh, in. So my two movies are Shaun of the Dead. Yes. And Pirate Radio. Ooh. So two of my right. favorite movies of all time. Um, very different, very funny, very quirky uh, uh, British movies. So anyway, here we go. So Shaun of the Dead is, if you've never seen it, a um, part of uh, Edgar Wright's Cornetto trilogy. So you've got uh, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and The World's End. So and Shaun of the Dead is the first one. A man decides to turn his moribund life around by winning back his ex-girlfriend, Reconciling his relationship with his mother and dealing with an entire community that has returned from the dead to eat the living. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, bum, bum, bum. <laughs> I got a good voice going on uh, for a second there. Okay, so the cast is Simon Pegg, uh, Nick Frost. It's directed by Edgar Wright. Uh, Kate Ashfield is Liz. And it, basically every other great British actor you know that was in Spaced in any other British movie, uh, is in this film because it's Edgar Wright, so he likes to pick his friends and his co-workers that he loves to be in all his movies. Right. And um, they just do a really incredible job. It's an absolute cult classic, um, fantastic throwbacks and pays homage to all the, you know, Night of the Living Dead, all the zombie movies, um, everything like that. And uh, it's just basically a really well put together, brilliant, funny, 
quirky, heartwarming, sad, everything film. It just encapsulate mm -hmm. a, encapsulates a lot of different genres. And Edgar Wright is one of my favorite directors. He's just amazing. So, okay, now for some facts. It came out in 2004. Uh, in the box office in the U.S., it grossed $13 million, but um, I'm sure it was way bigger than that overseas and everything. So if you added it up, I'm sure it'd be uh, uh, much more successful. The first viewing was years ago with my brother. Uh, I have an older brother who fostered my love of movies growing up because I watched movies with him. It was our thing that we did together. And so he was like, hey, you should watch this movie, Shaun of the Dead. It's kind of a part of a trilogy, the Edgar Wright. He's like a big comic book, you know, right. geeky, brilliant guy. He does all these great films, so we should watch you know, this movie together. And so that was my first viewing. And I probably view this movie once every few months. I just like to oh, nice. watch it and do it as like a marathon for the Cornetto Trilogy. So it's just like everybody should have a Cornetto Trilogy Sunday where you have a drunk brunch, like okay. a bottomless okay. mimosa brunch, and then you go home and you watch all these movies. So that's like my perfect day. Do you watch them with your drunk brunch friends? Or? So, well, okay. my friends, this isn't really their types of movies. Yeah. So it's more... It's always watch... hard. Yeah, that is hard. Because they'll want, you know, they're, I've tried to show them some of my movies, and they always hate them. They, I, I wanted to show them, like, Interview with a Vampire. Oh, they thought it nice. was the worst, weirdest movie ever. They were like, this is strange. Why is Tom Cruise right. bleeding on the floor? Like, they hated it. They thought it was so <laughs> weird. Um, they hate Silence of the Lambs. Anything I try and show them, they're like, ew, Stacy, why do you like this movie? So uh, they, uh, they're they not really into the same thing. So this is more of a Stacy me day okay. when I need some alone time and I just need to lose myself in a film. Um, so my favorite scene is when Sean and um, Ed are fighting zombies for the first time in the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's Mary, the little checkout girl, is there and they're like throwing um, discs at her to try and like kill her. And um, it's like, it's the second wait, album wait. I have a book. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't it records? <laughs> oh, records or, or yeah. whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and they're, yeah. And it's just the, like this really slow moving fight scene where she's barely moving an inch, but they're still like, you know, the music and, and the cuts <laughs> so, are trying to act like it's this oh, really man. highly intense scene, but she's like barely walking towards them and they can just literally sit there and decide which records to throw at her because they don't want to throw away the second record they ever bought. So, right. Yeah. I thought it was pretty brilliant and very, very funny. And another favorite scene of mine, and this is with Bill Nye, he plays Sean's stepfather. He's married to his mom. And they go over to save them um, from the zombie apocalypse. And you notice that Bill Nye's character has been bit on the arm. And you're like, oh my God, he's going to turn into a zombie. But, you know, the, the wife doesn't really, um, you know... Uh, accept it at first and so um everyone's kind of you know um freaking out about this and he's he says this line which i always say to my friends i'm like what are you talking about um he goes i'm quite all right barbara i ran it under a cold top like it's so it's so very british it's like just the most britney thing i've ever heard in my life and just the way he says it it's so bill nye like it's yes. it's so incredibly him and his character and i just thought it's every time it's a small little moment but i think it's so funny um, so, and then my least favorite scene is there isn't one. Everything's brilliant okay. in this movie. Awesome. So I'm not choosing any bad scenes because everything is great and it all fits together pretty well. So. I like when they pretend to be zombies. Like, yes. And that works for them. It does. Um, what else do I like? I like in the very beginning when it's like first revealed that like something has gone wrong <laughs> and it's like just a bloody handprint yeah. like on the and he convenience notice. store like yeah. Door to a refrigerator. When he's getting a little Cornetto ice cream yes. and soda for the oh morning. It's, there's so many little moments like that that it takes a brilliant director that has such a unique and steadfast vision that he knows every single thing that wants to go in the movie. Nothing is wasted. There's no right. small thing where it's like, oh, that's just there. It's Everything is meticulously planned out and put together. So um, a piece of trivia for that, which proves that um, everything goes together, is... Edgar Wright talked about on the DVD commentary how when Ed attempts to cheer Sean up at the Winchester with plans of the binge drinking day he wants to have, he actually summarizes the events of the whole movie. Um, so he makes a reference. He's like, let's go get a Bloody Mary 
And um, a Bloody Mary is the checkout girl's name is Mary. So mm-hmm. there you go. There's one. <laughs> and then um, have a bite at the king's head. So that's uh, Philip, Bill Nye's character, who's bit. And he's the head of the family. So the king's head. Good, good. Um, and then... Have a couple, which is David and Dee, the couple in the movie, at the little princess. Little princess is Liz. And then he wants to stagger back, stagger back like a zombie, (laughs) to the bar for shots, referencing in the last scene in the bar when they're shooting the rifle and everything. So that's that's a brilliant thing to put into a movie. They summarize the entire thing with inside jokes and innuendos, and you don't even realize it until you think about it. And you're like, oh my god, they did. That's the whole movie, and everything is referenced in that one Short little 30 second line. That's I love incredibly it. I love smart. It. So I thought that that was fantastic. So, anyway, that's uh, Shaun of the Dead. If you haven't seen it, watch that in the entire Cornetto trilogy because it's incredible. Now, I have seen Shaun of the Dead, but I have not seen Pirate Radio. Pirate so, Radio. Okay, so. Let's hear about Pirate Radio. Pirate Radio is one of those movies that I found watching, like, HBO one time when I was like, what is Pirate Radio? This, it's, um, it has all kinds of crazy costumes and music. This is going to be interesting. It's one of the best musical movies you'll ever see. It's a fantastic British comedy. It's a, a period comedy about an illegal radio station in the North Sea in the 60s. The film is very loosely based on Radio Caroline, a a popular pirate radio ship with a similar history and style. Um, So basically, um, back in the 60s in Great Britain, rock and roll was outlawed from um, being recorded on in, in Great Britain because they were like, it's the devil's music or whatever you want <laughs> right, to call it. Of course. And so radio stations found a way around this to where they would rent or buy a boat, um, uh, ship out about right. like a mile or two out, you know, out into the sea and park it there and they would record their radio station there. So they all lived on the boat right. and recorded everything and then, you know, would... Um, it would not satellite back to, but it, it would go back to um, the airwaves on uh, on land and people could listen to it. So they've kind of found a loophole and yes. went around the law. So this is a real thing that happened. Mm-hmm. And um, actually <laughs> several radio stations did this. So um, they called it, uh, in Great Britain, the movie was called The Boat That Rocked. It has a different right. title than here in the U.S. But it's absolutely brilliant and it has every important British actor, again, that we love. So, um, the cast, uh, it's got Philip Seymour Hoffman plays an American DJ called The Count, which was inspired by a real character who was an American DJ, came over to Great Britain to do this pirate radio thing. Um, Tom Sturridge is the young protagonist, Carl, which we relate to. Uh, Bill Nye plays, like, the head of the radio station. It's got Nick Frost, Chris O'Dowd, uh, Jenna Arterton, um, however you pronounce the name. January Jones has a small role in it. Um, Is she British? No, she's American. Okay, but she, and I've, she I've, plays American in the movie. She's been, you know, in love actually, and this. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So you kind of assume. Yeah. So she. Um, you never know. You never know. I think she's, I'm pretty sure she's American though. Probably. In interviews and stuff, she's she's American, I think. And then um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Rice Ifens plays Gavin. I think it's um, Reese. Reese, maybe Ifens. Um, I mean, he's been in everything, but you know, he was in. Um, uh, he was in Notting Hill. He played. Um, uh, Hugh Grant's uh, quirky roommate and all that stuff, mm, uh, just to give mm-hmm. people a visual. Uh, so he plays the completely strange, eccentric, uh, androgynous DJ that, of course, all the women fall in love with because he's so weird and every woman likes a weird, eccentric, uh, creative man. Um, so he's like the rival DJ to Philip Seymour Hoffman. So I, I love everybody in this movie. It's incredible. It's about this really quirky cast of characters just on this boat living their lives, loving rock and roll, and they're absolutely insane, having crazy parties. and It just encapsulates yeah. that time in the 60s, and the music is incredible, the costumes and everything. So this young man, Tom Sturge's character, uh, his, he's having some trouble. He got in trouble with the law. You know, he's like a juvenile delinquent kind of. So his mom, who knows Bill Nye's character from some time, like back in the day, she was kind of a, a groupie, I guess, or like a rock and roll or something. She, you know, was kind of part of the posse. Um, uh, it's Emma Thompson plays his mom. Yeah. So she's incredible. So she's like, okay, you're too much of a hassle right now. You're misbehaving. I'm sending you on that boat and you're going on that boat and you're good. So he, she'll like know where he is. He's in a stable 
not really a stable environment. It's the craziest, stupidest decision she could have made because this cast of characters is insane. But, like, she'll at least know where he is and he can't get in trouble too much. So it's about this young man going on this boat and finding out about this world of rock and roll and just getting to know all these incredible characters. So it's just crazy moments, insane music. Uh, it's just very, very quick-witted British comedy. And um, ev everyone, it's just this kooky crazy cast of characters that are insane and I, I absolutely love it it is so so enjoyable if anything for the soundtrack you've got to watch it of course it. and they're also i mean everyone's a brilliant you know thespian and so they just have these wonderful monologues and like little moments with him trying to like teach him you know life lessons and everything but they they have no room to talk about how to be an adult because they're all insane so it's just really quirky and adorable and, and a lot of fun it's really really entertaining so um it came out in 2009. Um, it box officed about like $8 million in the U.S. Um, so it wasn't a big hit over here, but it kind of gained like a cult following. So um, I probably watch it every every year or so, I guess, whenever, just whenever I feel like it, whenever I right. think about it and I have like a nostalgic feeling, I'm like, I want to watch um, Pirate Radio, so I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> and my favorite scene is Emma Thompson as the mom, and this is spoilers for the movie as well. Um, so she is on the boat visiting her son, and what they realize eventually is that I think she subconsciously sent him on the boat because his dad is on the boat. She doesn't know who his dad is. Huh. Um, they haven't talked about that, and he hasn't been in his life, but he kind of realizes once he meets one of the DJs there, like, oh my god, that, that might be my dad. If my mom was into this posse, into this group, right. you know, back in the day... Um, and she slept with all these guys. What if she's like, what if that's my dad? And so she, he's talking to his mom about this and he's like, mom, you know, how long ago was this? I mean, were you with him? And she's like, yes, I was with, he was absolutely gorgeous. Everyone did. And, and then he's like, well, is he my dad? And she goes, how old are you? And like, <laughs> questions it like to her son, which is a really funny moment, um, to be, for your mom to be like, what is going on with you again? Um, and then, yeah, there's not a least favorite scene because, um, everything is everything great because ev everything is awesome. <laughs> uh, if you haven't seen this movie, just watch it and some trivia. So, um, let's see, there's one scene in it where Carl is kind of sulking about a girl that he liked that didn't go with him. And so, or, you know, didn't do anything with them. So he just kind of sits on the bench and, um, uh, Richard, uh, Curtis, and um, whoever else was in the scene was supposed to just come and sit down and have a little, you know, just kind of pat him on the back. And it was supposed to be a 30-second yeah. scene. But what they ended up doing is going and sitting next to him and just talking to him as if it was a real friend that this has happened to. And for, it's like a five-minute really sweet scene. So they completely, like, you know, uh, improved everything that they were doing in the scene. And it's really cute. Wow. It's one of the best scenes in the movie. But they were just like, I'll just talk with him as if. It's, um, you know, one of my friends that this happened to. So I thought that was really cute and sweet. So that is Pirate Radio. Watch Love it. it. It's amazing. I need to see it. you got to see I, it. I, it's on my okay. list. On my list. Okay, so let's go back and see where we are right now. We started Back to the Future. Stacy linked that to About Time as a time travel film. Mm -hmm. And then she went to Bill Nye. Mm -hmm. And we had Pirate Radio and Shaun of the Dead. Yes. And so... Going back for mine, we started with Back to the Future. I went to some other film, <laughs> Somewhere in Time, <laughs> and that, as a time travel film. And now I'm going to be linking mine to romance fantasy films. Ooh. So I'm going to be talking about The Princess Bride, which I'm sure that you have already yes. seen. And I'm sure others have already seen this as well. This came out in 1987. And the synopsis is, while homesick in bed, a young boy's grandfather reads him a story called The Princess Bride. The story is a classic tale of love and adventure as the beautiful buttercup engaged to Prince Humperdinck is kidnapped and held against her will in order to start a war. It's up to Wesley, her childhood beau. <laughs> I love these things. Yeah. Now returned as the dread pirate Roberts to save her. On the way, he meets a thief and his hired helpers, an accomplished swordsman, and a huge, super strong giant, both of whom become Wesley's companions in his quest. Starring Carrie Elways as Wesley, Robin Wright as Buttercup, and a slew of other people, which we could totally get into, but we don't necessarily need to, because that's kind of all you need to know. Uh, directed by Rob Reiner, 
and written by William Goldman, who wrote the book and the screenplay. This had a $16 million budget and it grossed $30.9 million at the box office when it was released on September 25th, 1987. It won an Oscar for Best Music, some song called Storybook Love, which I have no clue what that is. I can't even think of that. <laughs> and I have not even really looked at it or, you know, because sometimes you th see things and you're like, all right, great. And then you move on. And that's what I did. The first time I saw this, it was probably, I think it was on VHS at the time. Um, because I remember seeing it with my cousins at my cousin's house. I'm sure I was pretty young. Um, probably like eight at the oldest. Like if it came out in 87, chances are it came out on VHS about a year later. So I may have been seven or eight. And then we were all watching it together with, you know, our moms. I just remember my aunt being like, wow, the Prince, Prince Humperdinck is really handsome. Like I remember <laughs> her saying that. <laughs> but, and I cannot remember the last time I saw the film. Probably while it was on television, I'm sure. Because it's always on television, it, it seems. Is. It's always on TNT. Uh, like that. my favorite scene anything with sword fighting is my favorite I just love the beginning when he's fighting and then they both like are like this is not my dominant hand either you know and they both say that and it's like <laughs> <laughs> and then the end when um, Inigo gets his revenge as well oh, yes. which is huge my least favorite scene is the torture chamber scenes obviously because no one wants to see Wesley like strung up and can I, just, can I just say that that is yes. my, um, actually favorite? my favorite scene because okay. when he's like, this is the pit of despair, <laughs> don't even think about it. <laughs> don't even think about it. And every time I like lose it, I think it's so funny. That is good. That is good. I just had to say that, my bad. Interrupting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what what I like best about this film. Just the fact that it's just a nice, fun adventure and it's still, it's something that's resonated in popular culture. Like, people quote it all the time and I don't know. I think it's just, it's everyone's rainy day movie. It's, sure. You can just put it on and just lose yourself in the film and just enjoy mm -hmm. it. You know? I, I love Fred Savage and like the, the kissing parts. Can yeah. we just skip those? <laughs> I was like, I'd totally do that as a kid. Like, we're not going to watch this. We need to fast forward or yeah. something like that. Which you can't fast forward anymore, but I guess you could skip. That's how it is. Um, so trivia. According to author William Goldman, when he first was trying to get the movie made in the 70s, he wanted Arnold Schwarzenegger because no one knew who Arnold Schwarzenegger was at the time um, to play, you know, the giant. And he thought, like, his first choice was Andre the Giant, but he thought, I'm not going to be able to get him because he's a little too big. Um, maybe I'll go with the smaller, you know, bodybuilder and we'll see, you know, how that works. Mm -hmm. And then eventually between the time that he wanted that and the time that they actually started producing the film and casting the film, like things had changed and Arnold Schwarzenegger was now kind of a bigger deal. And so Andre the Giant wasn't as much a big deal. And he's like, I can get my first choice. So I'm going to mm -hmm. go with my first choice. Like, I thought that's kind of cute. Um, Production was halted for about a day when Christopher Guest and Carrie Elways, they have the scene where Christopher Guest hits him on top of the head. And Carrie Elways told him to go ahead and do it. Like, just do it. I'm going to be fine. Like, make it real. And so he made it real and he actually hurt him. So, he <laughs> therefore, <actually passed> out. <laughs> therefore, a lesson may be learned here. Let's not do that. <laughs> I also read that Robin Wright and Carrie always were were sweet on each other, which yeah. is kind of cute. Mm -hmm. But it seems kind of natural. Like it, he's that's something that normally so happens. So incredibly gorgeous in this movie. Yes, like when he is like, you know, like in the farm boy um, scenes, and he's like got like the sunset in the background, and his hair is all coiffed, and he's just like sitting. And I'm yeah. just like, oh god, he's gorgeous. He is. He's a good looking man. How did that, like, not really, like, how did it take so long for her to be, like, farm boy, you're kind of hot. Like, yeah, I would have been, like, day one, like, yo, you can milk my goat any time. That made no sense. Um, you but, can milk a goat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, no, he's super gorgeous, and so is she, so that makes total sense that they're, they're babes, you know, they're total babes. Of mm -hmm. course, they would date in real life. Oh, uh, hilarious. Okay, so that's my film. That's, I don't really have much. I mean, there's, 
Everyone knows it. Uh, everyone, everyone knows, knows it. It's great. I love it. <laughs> it is. It's. I mean, it really is everyone's rainy day film. It's just, like you. Right. I can't find a certain per. Like I can find people who are like, well, I think it's a little overhyped, but, but no one's ever like, ugh, terrible movie. I hate it. Everyone's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I've seen it. You know, like everybody knows that it's just a great yeah. film, a feel good, unites the masses film. You know. Now, according to the author of the novel, he was he's. He was going to continue the story, mm. and he was going to put that out, I think, within this year or the next year or something like that, but he's been so blocked by the fact that Prin- The Princess Bride was such a big deal, mm-hmm. and it was so good, and he just felt like, I don't think I can make something as good as this, mm-hmm. well, so I don't sad. know if I'm going to be able to put out what I would like to for the audience, which is really sad, but at the same time, I get it, like wanting to stop when you're ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that in one of the anniversary editions of the no- of the novel, um, he released like a treatment, like this is what would, how the continuation of the story would kind of go. Like Wesley and Buttercup would have a daughter, and then that daughter would get kidnapped or something like that. Oh, so I like, like that. It's a, it was interesting and. I think it sounds like something that I would, you know, want to read or see, but I don't know. You and know that daughter's name was Waverly, which is my daughter's name. Oh, so that's fun. That's so cute. You know what? That actually sounds like the perfect movie to come out now. Because right. back in the day, I realized it would have been so overhyped and so big that it would have been too much. But now it's kind of got that, um, you know, old school vibe, like nostalgic vibe, where like the kids that loved it have now grown up. And now they can make a really cool movie centered on the daughter. And, right. like, it can be this really great, you know, continuation of the story. Because now we've kind of moved past the hype of it and moved past the popularity of it to where now it's just a classic. So then we, if we see in the next part of the story, you don't even have to have the original characters. It's right. just new characters, but it's the same universe. Actually, I would really love to see that. Yeah, and I let's don't know who, do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, <laughs> let's totally make that movie. Rob Reiner, you could yeah, do it again. Totally. Come on. Come on. Let's just get, it, get the gang back together. Yeah. We'll figure it out. The other film, so going under romance fantasy films, the other one that I selected, my next film is Edward Scissorhands from 1990. Um, it took me a while to figure out which movie I wanted to select after The Princess Bride because The Princess Bride is amazing. Um, But I thought, let's go something completely different, which, I mean, Tim Burton usually is completely different in Mm. almost everything that he does. So directed by Tim Burton and written by Tim Burton and Caroline Thompson. It is about a gentle man with scissors for hands who is brought into a new community after living in isolation, starring Johnny Depp as Edward, Winona Ryder as Kim, Diane Weist as Peg, which is Kim's mom. Um, Vincent Price is the inventor. Anthony Michael Hall is Jim, the jerk, and uh, Which Kathy I still Baker can't is Joyce. I know it's so weird when you watch it. You're like, oh my god, that's like the guy from Sixteen Candles. What's I going know on? what is going on. It's because you loved that character in Sixteen Candles so much because he's such a nerd, but he's so funny that you want to see that character in other things. And mm-hmm. then when you don't, it's like, wait a minute. Don't do this. But he's still so good in it, though. He is. He really he is, is a good actor. A, he is a horrible villain. Like, yeah. just terrible. Uh, this The budget was $20 million. It grossed $86 million and came out December 14th, 1990. And wa- had an Oscar nomination for Best Makeup. I don't know when I last saw this. Um, but probably within, like, the last two years around Christmas time. Like, yeah. sometimes it's... I don't know what makes it kind of Christmassy, why I'd want to watch it at Christmas. Maybe the part with the snow, and I mean, they're kind of going through that towards the end, um, which is my favorite scene, is her dancing while he's making the ice sculpture. I think Mm -hmm. that's pretty sweet. I also like when he's like in her room and she's on the camping trip and then she comes back and then he like <laughs> they're startled so he pops the water bed water beds were like a serious thing they like were back a in the big day. deal you I... were like a cool cool um too cool for school kind of person if you had a water bed yeah i don't a friend of mine had one and i was like i really don't understand why you have this what is this for what is what purpose is this 
Um, but yeah, I love it when he pops it. And obviously the least favorite would be when they set him up to commit the crime because he has no clue that he's, he just thinks he's helping them. Yeah. And he doesn't understand that. Yeah, he's too sad. simple and sweet and naive to, to know what's going on. That is, it makes me really genuinely sad when you watch it. Like my heart breaks whenever exactly that happens. It's such a good movie. I do love how they all embrace him though as yeah. well. Like, I mean, in the beginning... The mm-hmm. community embraces him, and they're like, yeah, you know, he, maybe he can cut hair. What yeah. can he do here? Like, how does he fit into this world? And, like, the ladies are kind of into him, which kind of is creepy. <laughs> I don't know. Every lady loves an eccentric weirdo. <laughs> we have learned this in every major motion picture. I guess so. The weird, quirky guy. I mean, every girl secretly has a fantasy about him. Cause you what wanted, is that about? It's like it's like doing a collectibles kind of thing. You know, <laughs> like you can collect like, oh, I dated that guy. You know, like you can yeah, just have sure. him in, in your roster. You feel like, I'm one of the ladies that have that's had that eccentric man over there. It makes huh. you feel important in a part of history, kind of. It's, like, that was I mean, one time in my life. And yeah. I've moved on. Like, women always wanted to be muses for these incredibly weird artists back in the day. You yeah. know, like Picasso and Dolly. Andy and Warhol. Andy Warhol. Like, everyone <laughs> just wanted to be, like, it made you feel important. Like, oh, I was one of his... Um, you know, I had a relationship with that person or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're like a part of history now, a part of the art world or whatever you want to right. you know, associate with that. That's my interpretation of that. Huh. I've yet to so date an eccentric artist myself, but it's on my list. I can too. give you some phone numbers. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> All right. So um, I do like, what I also like about this film is just how it looks, the color to it, and how, like, the neighborhood, that, I mean, that's Tim Burton's thing, is just how everything looks and is put together, and mm-hmm. just how it's, just the, the community itself, and everyone has these, like, vibrant-looking homes and mm-hmm. cars, and it's just stunning it's so otherworldly it's right. like it's not a world that we live in obviously right. you know his his movies are not a world we live in or could, could possibly but it's it's like taking someone's weird fantasy dream and just putting it on the screen and so you know mm-hmm. you're watching like another universe or another like you know you're watching a right. movie but you love the movie and you love the world so you like discovering new things about it versus like getting lost in it you know what i mean exactly. like it's like watching like a a weird puppet play going on <laughs> like you just want to see what's going on yeah. at every little corner and like see how detailed it is and everything it's incredible i just love how it's um gosh like how there's this community and then there's this castle yeah like, no what? one ta- like no one questioned the castle. No one was like, "Hello, what's up with that creepy, weird castle over there that's gray?" And I know that this com- the community was based on Burbank because that's where Tim Burton grew up, and I lived in Burbank for many years. Mm-hmm. And that's like the one like if you ever watched the Wonder Years, that's what the community looks like. So it does look like exactly mm-hmm. this community that they have in Edward Scissorhands, just not as colorful. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is like kind of a castle on the hill. That you'd be like, what's up with the king and queen of Burbank? Like, who are these people? I didn't know that. Oh, Oh, yeah. So maybe, I don't know if the castle was there when Tim Burton was, you know, growing up. But Mm -hmm. maybe he was like, what's up with the castle? Like, (laughs) maybe I should do something. Like, maybe I should write something about this castle. Like, mystery. The mystery castle. Anyways, um, a bit of trivia and then we'll wrap this up a little bit. Um, Vincent Price's role as the inventor was supposed to be larger but he became really ill, so they had to cut it down, which is too bad. Um, Tim Burton says that Edward Scissorhands is his favorite film that he's made, and Danny Elfman also thinks it's his favorite soundtrack that he's made, so that's really nice. The soundtrack is incredible. Oh, the little blonde boy on the slip and slide in the beginning of the film. It's like... Two seconds extra, obviously, is Nick Carter from Backstreet Boys. <gasps> no, it's not. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. The so that is it. All right. Whoa. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so we have gone through six degrees of feature film. We've started with our feature film, which was Back to the Future. From there, we went to... About Time. And Somewhere in Time, which are time travel films. From there, we took About Time and we linked it to... Shaun of the Dead and Pirate Radio. And from Somewhere in Time, we linked it to Edward Scissorhands and The Princess Bride. 
So for our closing segment, we're going to do what's called Link Tweets, might change names at some point, where we um, ask you about one of the links. So I asked, what is your favorite time, what is one of your favorite time travel films, not including Back to the Future, because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just going to get Back to the Future, because everyone knows that I like Back to the Future. So I figured uh, people might say to me, oh, Back to the Future, just because they know I like it. Mm -hmm. Um, So we got Tyler Myers and Brooks Wilkins. They like looper we didn't get any of the ones that we we didn't get about time or somewhere in time obviously because mainly men are the ones that are uh <laughs> tweeting yeah, at me yeah. uh mike cole likes t2 judgment day that's a good one nathan Solid mac choice. 12 monkeys abe lopez primer 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 mm, we'll go with either it's primer. <laughs> okay okay we'll go with primer um devin colson x-men days of future past uh, we got to vote for Source Code. We got to vote for the first Terminator film, Edge of Tomorrow. Roger Barr likes Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And Lee underscore Nostromo likes Star Trek The Voyage Home. So those were a few people that had sent in tweets about films that they like. Thanks, guys. And I, we also want to connect our feature film to Kevin Bacon. So we're going to tell you how Kevin Bacon links up to Back to the Future. So Kevin Bacon was in Footloose with Chris Penn, who was in All the Right Moves with Leah Thompson, who was in Back to the Future. So yes. There you go. That's three. We did good. We did, we did good. good. Three degrees. That's awesome. <laughs> Sometimes it's a yeah. stretch, but that was a pretty yeah. easy one. That was good. Yeah. I think other ones are going to be really easy. Um, so where can we find you, Stacy? You can find me on Twitter at SOHoward2012. And you can find me on Twitter at Miss Movies. And you can also find me on Instagram if you want to follow me there. That's Miss underscore Movies, though. Wow. So there you have it. Mm. Thanks for joining us today. This has been a lot of fun. We should do it again. Totally. Oh, my gosh. Let's do another episode in like five minutes. Okay. We'll do it. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Six Degrees of Feature Film is produced by Stacey Howard and me. Special thank you to Ken Knapsack for our intro and Matt Brown for our artwork. 